When we're providing medical care for a patient, we want to use a set algorithm to go by so that we don't just uh, start looking at the worst injury or what appears to be the worst injury for that patient and get tunnel vision into this one area while there's other things that need to be taken care of on this patient. So today we're gonna look at a trauma assessment and we're gonna take you step by step how to properly assess a patient and be able to provide the best care for this injured person. When we're looking to provide care to an injured person, we want to use an algorithm to be able to guide our assessment and our treatment process. If we just start jumping in there and treating patients based on what we see, there's a lot of stuff that we're gonna miss because a angulated uh, fracture is gonna look way worse than someone that's not breathing. Unless you really assess, you may not know that this person is barely breathing because you're looking at a bunch of blood and broken bone fragments and that kind of thing. But we still have to make sure we're taking care of the breathing even though it doesn't jump out at us like the fractures or the bleeding does. So in order to make sure we have a systematic approach to a patient assessment, we're gonna use a system. And there are a lot of different systems out there for patient assessment. Now, a nursing assessment at an ER or a hospital is gonna look different than what an EMT or a paramedic does out in the field. What an EMT or a paramedic does in the field to cover a whole broad range of different types of calls they may go on is gonna look different than say the March algorithm that's an assessment meant for severe trauma and active shooter, severe bleeding, military uh, type trauma assessments. There are a lot of things that are already taken care of in the military world um, as far as scene security and BSI and everything that we don't necessarily have in our assessment but when we go to like a national registry assessment for EMTs and paramedics, we add some of those extra things in there. What we're going over today is the National Registry of EMTs Trauma Assessment. This is meant for trauma patients in a pre-hospital setting. And this is gonna cover a lot more in depth, some extra things that we wanna keep in mind um, that a specific March algorithm won't cover. Now, don't get me wrong, the March algorithm is a good uh, algorithm for a patient assessment and for being able to provide trauma care to a patient, but it does leave out some things such as C-spine immobilization, um, updating your incoming EMS unit with uh, information about the patient, making transport decisions, um, vitals and reassessing vitals. So even though you use a March algorithm for uh, critical injuries, this in our EMT trauma assessment is gonna take that a step further and add some extra memory prompts in there to remind us of things that we should be doing in a regular pre-hospital setting or while we as civilians are treating a patient waiting on an ambulance to get to where we are. One last thing before we jump into the trauma assessment. In our EMT is a, a group that is putting out these assessments for EMTs and paramedics that are gonna be working pre-hospital and they have two different assessments. They have a trauma assessment and a medical assessment. So based on what type of patient you're responding to, you're gonna use one route or another. Um, and today we're only gonna be looking at the trauma assessment. We will put a link to the trauma assessment, a PDF of that down below in the description. So you can follow that link to be able to print this out so you can have this for your reference. Um, and this is coming directly from in our EMT's website. So the first thing is gonna be PPE. This is personal protective equipment, or as some people say, BSI. Uh, body substance isolation. We want to protect ourselves from any diseases that may be in that person's blood. And we also want to keep any dirt or anything that we have on us from getting inside that person's blood and in their open wounds as we're now treating them. So let's make sure we have at least gloves on. If it's going to be a really messy scene, you may want eye protection of some form on as well. Another aspect of the scene safety is to make sure that there are no other threats or dangers to the scene. So if this is an active shooter and there's still a shooter on the loose, well, if that person is now to where that active shooter is, if I go render aid, I may get shot as well, and now I'm no help to that patient. So we kind of want to make sure that this scene is secure and it's safe to operate in. Um, we either need to make that scene secure or we need to move that patient quickly out of harm's way so that we can finish our assessment. So let's keep in mind our scene security and our proper PPE or BSI, whatever you want to call it, before we continue on with our assessment. Next up, we want to consider what was the mechanism of injury for this trauma patient. 
Um, in this specific case with the scenario we're about to run through, it was a fall. They had a fall from 20 feet, um, let's say out of a tree or off the top of a building. So we had a significant mechanism of injury from the significant distance that they fell. Next up, additional resources. What else do we think we're gonna need? If I'm responding on an ambulance, well then I may have the resources I need. I may also ad need additional resources from a fire department to come help with some technical rescue. Um, if I'm responding as a civilian to go help somebody out, has 911 been notified? Do we have an ambulance? What's gonna be the treatment for that patient once we do our initial treatment? What's gonna be definitive care for them? How are we getting them to a hospital? The next thing to consider is the number of patients. If it's one patient, that's easy. We have resources, multiple resources for one patient. But if I have myself going to help somebody and I find out that there are five patients, now I am overwhelmed and I don't have enough resources in and of myself to be able to care for five critical patients at one time. So that's where knowing the number of patients and what other resources you need coming as well comes into play. Last but not least, we wanna consider C-spine. We want this at least to be in our head as we're approaching the scene and approaching the patient. Do we need to take C-spine on this patient? Do we need to protect their spine? Based on the mechanism of injury and what we know about this call, is that gonna be something that we need to do? And for a lot of these trauma patients, if they have head injury or potential for back injury, we wanna stabilize that spine so that we don't make any matters worse. Next up, as we approach the patient, we want to be looking for a general impression of the patient. Does this patient look dead? Do they look fine? Are they having a difficulty breathing? Is there spurting blood somewhere? What's our general impression? Sick or not sick? Does this patient look like they need critical help or does it overall look good but they may have a sprained ankle or some other type of minor injury? So as we approach, what's our general impression of the patient? I'm approaching the patient um, and I'm initially just gonna talk. I can introduce myself if they're awake, um, but in this case, I'm just gonna say, hey, sir, are you okay? Can you hear me? Get no response. So at this point, I want to um, start some sort of pain response from them. I don't wanna hurt them too bad, but we need some sort of response to see if they are grimacing or reacting to anything I'm doing at all. So um, I can uh, push on the nail bed, especially if I have a pin or a hard object just to inflict a little bit of pain on the nail bed. I can also pinch uh, the muscle by their neck right here a little bit. That'll inflict just a little bit of pain to see if I get any sort of grimace or response from them to determine level of consciousness. Um, the old style of doing this was to do a sternum rub. I take my knuckles and I just rub it on their sternum to see if that painful stimuli uh, gets any response. The problem is if I do that too hard and he does come around, then he's gonna tell me he's got some chest pain because his chest hurts. Now I can't differentiate between was that chest pain he had before or is that because I did a sternum rub? So I'm not a big fan of that. So let's use the nail beds um, or the pinch of the muscle here to be able to determine a painful response from them. So I've done that, I still have no response from my patient, so I need to continue on in my assessment. At this point, we wanna manage any life threats. As we walk up to this patient, is there bright red spurting blood? If there is, we need to put a tourniquet on immediately. We're not gonna wait for the rest of our assessment before we manage immediate life threats. Is this person in a car that's about to fall off of a cliff? Let's pull that patient out and manage that life threat and take care of our scene security before that patient falls off the edge of the cliff. All right, so we've approached the patient, we've made an introduction to the patient, established a mental status. Now, let's take a look at our ABCs and then go through our physical assessment as well. In our primary assessment, we're gonna use ABC as a guide for our primary things we wanna take care of. A is for airway. We wanna make sure the airway is open. So at this point, we can do a head tilt chin lift, but for a trauma patient where we're concerned about C-spine, we can do a jaw thrust. For a jaw thrust, we're gonna come right up underneath the jaw and we're gonna displace the jaw up. So on this side of the patient, we'll find the jaw line and I'll put the heel of my hand on his cheekbone and I can push the jaw up forward and that will push the jaw forward, lifting the tongue off the back of the throat and that keeps us from manipulating this neck too much and doing a head tilt chin lift to where now we're manipulating that neck in case he does have a neck fracture. So we'll do the jaw thrust maneuver on this trauma patient. Under airway, this would also be the time that we could go ahead and place any airway adjuncts. For him being unresponsive, uh, we could insert either an NPA or an OPA. Um, we can only insert the OPA if he doesn't have a gag reflex, so that is something that we would want to be careful of, and if he uh, did end up vomiting while we're trying to insert an OPA, we would want to pull that out. We would want to roll him to his side, suction if I have that available, but we don't want him to aspirate on any of that vomit, so we have to be really careful. So make sure that if you're inserting any airway adjuncts, you've been properly trained to do so. Okay, next up is B for breathing. So we want to assess his breathing. We want to see the rate and the quality. Is he breathing adequately? 
Is it really shallow? Is it rapid? Is it slow? What are the descriptors we're going to use to describe his breathing? So I'm looking at his chest. I am seeing his breathing rate. I want to see his work of breathing and want to make sure that he is breathing. If he's not breathing, then we want to uh, put a BVM on his face. We want to use that now to artificially ventilate, to take over those ventilations for him. So now we are breathing uh, for him since he's not breathing on his own. Under breathing would also be the time that we would administer oxygen. So even if we're not using a BVM for that, this could be the time that we put on a nasal cannula or a non-air breather for our patient. In this scenario, we're gonna say that he is breathing, he's breathing adequately, um, yet he is still unresponsive. The last thing we wanna consider under breathing is managing or taking care of any injuries that are prohibiting um, the person from breathing or interfering with the way that they would breathe. So this is gonna be a sucking chest wound that we need to put an occlusive dressing or a chest seal on. Um, any other injury that is um, around the chest that is gonna be uh, affecting the way that they breathe. We wanna go ahead and take care of that now under breathing. Next up is circulation. So circulation, we're talking about the blood moving through the body and taking oxygen from our lungs out to our cells. Um, so really we're gonna be assessing the skin color, temp, and condition because how well the skin is perfused with oxygen is going to tell us how well that blood is getting that oxygen around. So if they are pale, cool, and sweaty, that's going to be a problem. If their skin looks uh, pink, warm, and dry, that's a good sign because we know that that blood is getting out to the extremities and taking care of what it needs to take care of. Under circulation, we're also going to check for a pulse. So as we're checking for a carotid pulse, the carotid arteries run on either side of the trachea. So there's a little bit of a valley on either side. So if you take two fingers, I would use two middle fingers or your pointer finger and your middle finger, and start right on top of the trachea and slide it down off into the valley. And we're gonna feel for a pulse on an unresponsive there. If the person's responsive, we can feel on a radial pulse here on the side. Um, it's gonna be on the thumb side of your wrist. We'll put two fingers there and feel for a pulse. And if it is a child, we're gonna feel for a brachial pulse. So that's gonna be just up underneath uh, the arm, up underneath the bicep. You'll feel up underneath the arm there on a child. As we're feeling for a pulse, we are going to be feeling for how strong the pulse is. If it's really weak and hard to feel, that means their blood pressure is gonna be lower. If it's really strong and bounding, we know they have an increased blood pressure. And so this is not giving us a detailed number on the blood pressure, but at least lets us know, hey, does the blood pressure seem low or high? We're also determining the rate of the heart rate right now. So is it really fast? Is it really slow or does it seem pretty normal? Again, not a detailed assessment of exactly what number the heart rate is, but overall we wanna know if I quickly feel this, okay, it seems really rapid. His body may be compensating for something, maybe blood loss. So as I assess a pulse rate, I wanna know if it is a bounding pulse or a thready pulse. Is that a strong pulse or a weak pulse? And then I also wanna know the rate. Does it seem fast, slow, or pretty normal? Under circulation, we also wanna take care of any other major bleeding that we see that we have not taken care of in our uh, life threats from earlier. And then we also wanna go ahead and initiate treatment for shock at this point. The big thing here is really gonna to be to keep this patient warm. If they've lost a lot of blood or if they're not compensating like normal, uh, we may have an issue with thermoregulation. So we wanna make sure that we keep this patient warm as we continue our assessment. So the next point on our assessment is determining the uh, criticalness of the patient and then also the treatment um, and transport decisions for this patient. Is this gonna be somebody that needs to get thrown in an ambulance and taken to surgery immediately or they're gonna die? Or is this someone that we need to start doing some treatment like splinting or putting them on a long spine board or do we need to evacuate them? What, what are our treatments and how much time do we have to work with this patient based on the initial primary survey that we just completed? Next up is gonna be our vital signs. This is where we wanna get a accurate number for a heart rate. We wanna get a blood pressure. We wanna get a manual first. So even if you have a heart monitor or some device that will take an automatic blood pressure, we wanna start with a manual blood pressure to make sure that our baseline is a true accurate reading since some of the electronic equipment can be off. We also want to uh, use a pulse ox if possible to determine a oxygen saturation um, for these patients. And then we want to get a breathing rate on this patient as well. A fifth vital sign that could be helpful in a lot of cases is a blood glucose because we have an unresponsive patient that fell. We don't know if he fell and then became unresponsive 
or if he went unresponsive due to low blood sugar or some other cardiac event and then fell as a result of that. Next up is our sample history, S-A-M-P-L-E. We have signs and symptoms, allergies, medication, past pertinent medical history, last oral intake, and events leading up to. This is gonna give us some more information about this patient specifically, and in this case, I'm gonna have a hard time getting that from an unresponsive patient. So the best thing for me to do is to look for a medical bracelet or a medical necklace that he may be wearing that may indicate they're a diabetic or they have allergies. Um, and then also any bystanders or family that may be with the patient may be able to provide some of that information for an unresponsive patient. Okay, now we're gonna start our secondary assessment. This is a head to toe assessment to figure out what's wrong with this patient and make sure that we don't miss any injuries um, on this person. Because they're unresponsive, they can't tell me what's hurting, so I have to physically find what may be wrong with them. If they are responsive and they're complaining of severe pain and an obvious fracture in their leg, my attention is gonna be drawn into that, but there may also be other injuries that don't hurt as much, but may be critical that I need to take a look at as well. So this is why we wanna do a head to toe assessment on a trauma patient. So as we start, we're looking for DCAP BTLS. Deformities, contusions, abrasions, penetrations, burns, tenderness, lacerations, and swelling. So all those things, it's just a fancy little uh, memory jog to remember what I'm looking for. But really, I'm looking for abnormalities. Any abnormalities that don't seem normal for this patient, signs of injury. Okay, as I start at the head, I'm gonna be feeling for any fractures to see if we have any skull fractures, feeling the cheekbone for any fractures, uh, the jaw, make sure everything's in place there. I'm looking at the ears to look for any blood or cerebral spinal fluid that may be coming out, indicating a skull fracture. Um, as I move around the back side of the head with my fingers, I wanna pull them back as well and look to see if there's any blood that ends up on my hands uh, because I'm gonna have a hard time seeing that from here. Um, as I move down, this is also the time that I wanna take a look at my pupils. So I will check the pupil response, make sure that both pupils together are equal, that they're both reactive to light, document any abnormalities that I find there and continue on with my assessment. As I come to the neck, I wanna make sure that there's no uh, signs of trauma. I wanna make sure the trachea is midline. I wanna make sure I don't have any engorged or uh, distended jugular veins. I also wanna reach around the back of the neck and feel the C-spine or the cervical spine. Make sure there's no abnormalities, no fractures, nothing protruding that feels abnormal and then continue on down from there. So as I come down to the chest now, I wanna be feeling the collarbone, the rib cage. I wanna be uh, palpating and checking for any uh, injury, any broken ribs, any fractures that we have. Um, this is also the time to expose the chest because if he's fallen and there is um, a bunch of bruising or there's something, a uh, stick or something that is now sticking out from his chest, I'm not gonna be able to see that well. So we're gonna use our trauma shears. We'll cut the shirt off as well so we can look at the chest um, while we're doing our assessment as well. Another part of the physical assessment for the chest is we will listen to lung sounds, especially on an unresponsive where we don't know what's going on. Um, we want to be able to, to determine if they have a uh, pneumothorax, a collapsed lung on one side. So we'll go ahead and give a listen to lung sounds as well. We're gonna move down to the abdomen. We're gonna palpate all four quadrants. So if you take the abdomen and we split it into four even sections, I want the right upper, right lower, left upper, left lower, and I wanna palpate and feel. I'm feeling for softness. If it's rigid, there may be internal bleeding. Um, so I also wanna see if there's any moaning or groaning or responsiveness from him that would indicate severe pain in a specific area. Moving down to the pelvis, I'm gonna push in and down on the pelvis to make sure there's not a pelvic fracture, make sure the bones aren't moving there. Um, they used to teach to rock the pelvis and see if you f felt any grinding or any uh, bones moving probably not the best thing for a pelvis that is fractured. It will tell you if the pelvis is fractured or not, but it's not gonna be real good for the patient. So let's push in and see if there's any movement and let's push down. And as long as everything feels pretty secure, um, then we can go ahead and move on with our assessment. If it feels insecure, let's go ahead and throw a pelvic binder on. Or if you want to, you can throw a pelvic binder on if there's enough uh, significant damage or significant injury to the patient to where we think that that could help the patient. Let's move down now to the legs. So we're gonna be feeling the legs. Again, any sides underneath, we're gonna be feeling underneath and checking our hands for blood. We wanna make sure that all the long bones are in place. As we move down to the feet, we're gonna cut the boots off or take the boots off. We wanna feel for a distal pulse. So we wanna make sure that we have a pulse on the top of the foot um, and then if they're responsive, this is where we would also check to see if they could wiggle their toes, if they could feel if you're touching their toes, 
we don't get that luxury with someone that's unresponsive, so we move on. We're gonna do the other leg as well, sweeping down here, make sure there's no fractures, no DCAT BTLS noted on the legs, cut the pant leg up so we can see the legs as well, check a pulse on this side, wiggle your toes, all that good stuff over here too. Now that we've gone head to toe, we're gonna to come back up and get the upper extremities. This is where we're gonna feel down the arm. We're gonna get down um, here. We're gonna check for a pulse as well. Again, if they're responsive, we're gonna say, hey, can you wiggle your fingers? Um, can you feel you know, what finger am I touching down here to make sure they have good pulse, motor, and sensory in each extremity? We'll do this one. Come down, checking for blood. Come down here, check for a pulse, wiggle the fingers, all that good stuff as well. Last but not least, we need to roll this patient, we need to check their backside. That's the only place we haven't checked. Make sure you don't forget this. If this patient has to go on a stretcher or a litter or a uh, long spine board, if the protocol in your area exists for that, those are kind of falling out of favor, but if you're gonna do that, um, then we want to do all that at one time so we're not manipulating this patient multiple times. So whenever we're ready to go ahead and move this patient onto a stretcher, we can do what's called a log roll and we can check the back while we're in the process of getting them on the stretcher. Okay, so a log roll would go something like this. We'd have multiple people to help with this, um, but we would take this arm, we would reach here, we would roll the patient up, we would have somebody supporting the head as well for C-spine so that we're not manipulating the neck. Somebody should maintain that C-spine the entire time. I'm a little shorthanded here for the sake of this demonstration. Um, and then we're gonna start at the top from the C-spine where we uh, fell earlier, and we're gonna work our way all the way down the spine. We wanna look for any uh, vertebrae that are off to the side, anything that seems fractured, and remember the shirt is gone as well, so now we're looking for any abnormalities, bruise anything, as we go down and check the backside. We're also looking for any open injuries or wounds here that we can cover with an inclusive dressing in the uh, chest area. So anything that needs to be done on the backside, we'll do now. If we're putting them on a stretcher, this is the time that we could put a sheet or a board or something behind them and roll them back on the board to be able to pick them up and move them. Okay, head to toe is done. We've done our physical assessment or our secondary assessment. Now is our time for treatment. Let's start IVs, let's give medications, let's splint our injuries. All that stuff comes now. Then once we have administered those treatments, then we need to go back and reassess. If we have splinted, we wanna go back and make sure they still have good pulse motor sensory in the extremities we've splinted. We wanna recheck their vitals for critical patients like this one. We would recheck the vitals every five minutes. For a non-critical patient, we would reassess those vitals every 15 minutes. We just keep checking and trending and documenting all that so we know if this patient's getting better or worse and we've got a history now that we can work from as we're trending and treating this patient. All right, let's do a quick recap. So we've got five things we do before we get to our patient. Then we get a general impression of our patient, take care of any life threats and establish a mental status, baseline mental status for our patient. Then we take care of our ABCs. These are the things that are necessary for immediate life, airway, breathing, and circulation. After that, we determine a transport decision or we update any uh, incoming EMS crews or anybody with some additional information at that point. Moving past that, we're gonna get into a trauma assessment and do an assessment to find out what injuries this patient has. Following that, we'll do a uh, set of vitals on this patient, so now we have a baseline set of vitals. And then we'll also get a sample history so that we know allergies, meds, and all that good stuff as well. After that point, now we can provide treatment and then also reassess every five minutes for a critical patient or 15 minutes for a stable patient. All right, so that's an overview of the NREMT trauma assessment. Hope this video was helpful and hope this helped break this down in a manageable fashion for you. Uh, check out the link below for the PDF of this assessment. And as always, stay vigilant and stay safe.